Okay, well, everybody, uh, welcome to the third of our special Pennsylvania Archaeological Council speaker series uh, held this month in October, Archaeology Month. We have as our guest tonight, Kate Preselak, who is going to be talking about Carol Cabin. Now, briefly, Kate is a professional archaeologist and she currently works for McCormick Taylor. She received her Master's of Science in Applied Archaeology from Indiana University of Pennsylvania a few years ago, but she has many years of practical field experience since she started in her teens in the field. Um, she was also one of our FAST field directors back in the day when I was with PennDOT, and she did that for two years. And her master's thesis, which she has managed to turn in to gold here has not only won a PA prize, the Pennsylvania Preservation Prize as, uh, for planning, but also uh, in the summer issue of PA um, Heritage had a, an article in there describing her work as well. Uh, just as an aside, in this household, I have to say PA Heritage and hushed tones since my wife is the editor of Pennsylvania History, which is the premier <laughs> historical magazine in the state. Um, so I have to tread very lightly when I mention the other magazine. All right, so um, let's see how we're doing here. Uh, I'll give it about one more minute. Uh, Kate, uh, it'll turn it over to you and you'll have the screen and uh, the floor time. Uh, also, by the way, if you have any questions for her, please put those in the chat room, in the chat. We'll accumulate them during the presentation. And at the end, there will be sufficient time for question and answer uh, as we wind down. So hopefully we can get to all of your questions as well. So without further ado, here's Kate Preselak. Thank you, Ira. All right, everybody. Oops. So as Ira said, my PowerPoint tonight will be about uh, my thesis research. And so thank you for coming and joining this presentation. Um, as some of, so some of you will know a little bit about this research if you read the article, but I'm basically gonna go through and discuss some of the basics about um, my research and the history, and then also a little bit about what's been happening with the property since um, my thesis research was completed. And this is an image of the Carroll Cabin. So I use the Carroll Cabin as a term that I created from my thesis research, but a cabin is typically an, an unhewn log home, whereas the original half on the left or the south side is a hewn log home with an addition that is the original 1866-1867 edition. But the Carroll Cabin is in reference to the people who used to live there. The quote I have here is the first principle of ethics for the SAA archeological ethics. Um, it's one of my favorites and I think it's really appropriate for not only archeology span in general, but especially for this project and considering how much I've invested in trying to advocate for the property and not just me, but DCNR as a whole um, and the work that they've been doing before my involvement and during this, these recent years to continue to preserve this. Um, you know, as it says, we have a responsibility as archeologists to promote what we're finding and what we're researching um, in order to increase public understanding and support for its long-term preservation. The Carroll Cabin is located in southwestern Pennsylvania in Fayette County. Um, I didn't want to be too specific about it, but um, it is on public land. It's public, publicly owned. And the lower right-hand photo here is just an aerial, as it says, from 39, showing not just the house, but also in its context, the landscape of the farm that it used to be sitting on. Um, and we know that it was a farm since at least the 1850s. 
my research questions that were the subject of my research are shown here, looking at just basically how long the house was inhabited, when was it built, general questions for historical archaeology, how did it evolve over time, maybe direction, did things inside or outside change, location of buildings and similar things. And then also looking at children, sometimes the presence of children can get lost in different research. So I just wanted to have a specific question to see whether or not what I was researching could pinpoint anything about children in the family. And then how did this farmstead conform or diverge from documented subsistence strategies and the economy of the local region and state? So how linked was it or wasn't it to both local economic enterprises and broader enterprises? In order to answer these questions, I looked at five different methodologies to get at the, the data. As you can see, I did a documentary research. I went to the courthouse. Um, I looked at the paper maps, well, the aerial imagery um, and other available maps that we typically use for archeological surveys. I did an architectural survey of the building. Um, you'll see one of the drawings that I created just looking at the hardware that was used um, anything that could get at both a date and, like I said, how the house has changed over time. I did do some excavation, but I wanted to keep it minimal just because of the expense of curation and being able to budget my grant money to appropriately conserve them in the future. I also did dendrochronology. I myself didn't analyze the borings, but I collected them with the help of a DCNR forester and then sent them to Cornell Tree Ring Laboratory, and they did the research and analysis on that. And that's a, a key and really cool part of this research. And then I also did soil chemistry analysis. And I'll go into that a little bit more, but just taking samples from across the historic farmstead as I could see it in 1939 and try to analyze any concentrations of potential human activity. It leaves different um, elemental traces. So in terms of the documentary research, this is just a snapshot of some of the information that I looked at. Um, you have county reference books, you have um, biographical sketches where you can look at early people in the county and most counties have this, they're really cool um, just to look at, you know, the people who lived in these areas that are at least documented in, this, in these types of books. And then to the right is actually a copy of the original indenture for I think it's William Carroll. Um, and this actually came from one of the two brothers who owned the property and donated it um, as we'll talk about later. And so this was a really cool piece of information that I might not have found otherwise. And then also up in the upper left is an article that was written when um, Carroll descendants purchased the house and fixed it up. And it was just sort of a really cool feature piece um, on the home. And if you look in this lower photo, uh, the young boy or the young man who's in the photo, he is one of the two brothers who donated the home. So him and his brother grew up in this house as a summer home when their parents bought it. And then I put this in, this is just a really cool photograph. This isn't obviously the Carroll cabin, but the Asbury Carroll family. Um, and you can see some of the family members here I love looking at historical photos of people, so. Um, in addition to historic documents, I also built a chain of title. And you can see all the values that are associated with these were estimated to the 1866 rate. So the dollars in comparison um, are all basically leveled to the same, um, same base rate. So we know that Thomas, Thomas Ramsey owned this property. He had it warranted in the late 1700s. We really don't know if he built a home there. Um, and he is very likely connected to Dr. Robert Johnston. Um, and then the LaRue brothers brought a, bought a significant amount of property. Um, but you can see that the value of the property significantly increased when James Harvey purchased the property in 1833. He's listed as a farmer. Um, his first child was in 1834, so it seems likely that he probably purchased this property and began farming um, before having a family. Um, and given the fact that it's an increased value, the home was probably built 
by then. Um, so this continues to show different purchases. William Asbury Carroll, who was the first Carroll relative to live in this home, purchased it in 1866. The property became sort of split up after his original ownership through different heirs. But then in 1952, uh, Anna B. Carroll Jones, who is the, the, the link there, and her husband, Alfred Jones, purchased the property um, and all the broken up parcels and kind of brought it back into one. Like it says, they made repairs and they did so in a very conscientious manner and selected certain timbers that needed replaced and um, did make a few changes inside, but overall did not change it in the way you might expect um, when someone, you know, goes back, goes back and lives in a property um, and renovates it. So then, as you can see, it was donated in the early 2000s. Some of the architectural research, like I said, looking at different parts of the home, the hardware, the timbers themselves, um, do certain logs show different shaping? Does it look like they were used potentially in other parts of the building and then moved, perhaps moved from somewhere else? Um, the lower right photo is one of my favorites. This is actually an image of a photogrammetry file that Jay Sean Combs, who was one of the Harrisburg interns during, during the year I was doing my thesis research and he came out and helped when we did FAST projects. He's an archeologist in California now, but he did photogrammetry for his thesis research and also came out and did a little bit of work on the Carroll cabin. And what's really cool about this is not only you have a document of the home in photographs, but he stitched them all together and you can actually rotate this image and look at it from different sides. And it's such a great preservation and documentary um, technique. Uh, the photos in the center, the top photo is what the home looked like before the Jones family purchased, purchased it in 1852, before any renovations were made. You can see it's in disrepair um, and some of the boards are in pretty bad shape. But then you look down at the photo below it and that's either Morrow or Dan Jones. I'm not, I'm not totally sure which one anymore, but you can see that they've replaced some of the worn timbers. They did add Portland cement because that's what was recommended to them at the time. Um, and you can also see that the porch that you'll see in later images is not there. So that porch in front of the hewn cabin, the hewn home was added later. And then on the left, this is just a sketch that I did, scaled you know, to show and document internal stairs, um, doorways, and also the division between both the original log home and the 1867 edition. These are just a few images of the home and the surrounding woods from when I was doing my thesis research. The DCNR staff who own the property um, and are nearby have since mowed the grass and vegetation. They've taken down trees that are definitely dead in order to protect the home. There's no vines growing on it. So they're maintaining it very well. Um, and the image on the left is an old logger road. And what I find incredibly cool about this is if you look in the back left of the photo, there's a huge oak tree and also on the right in the foreground, there's another one. So I did sample some of those, um, as you can see, Forrester Campbell um, in the lower right photo, helping me extract one of the, the cores with an increment borer. Um, the trees were a lot wider than what the increment borer or the tool to take out this, the tree ring sample was, um, but just seeing them, knowing them, that they're there probably to help identify property boundaries in the past, just other aspects of the landscape around the, the cabin um, that just reflect historic changes on the property. The archeological excavation that was performed, as you can see, I had three test units and they were primarily to sample what was adjacent to the home, um, looking for any kind of evidence of both the division between the original home 
and the addition, and also just to see different areas. Like test unit three is down below what appeared to be a stone step or some kind of long cut stone. So I wanted to see what was there. It wasn't really searching for middens or privies or anything, but on the left here, you can see a map of where I did my test units um, in reference scaled to the home itself. There is a spring box to the left. Um, it probably was built in the later 1900s, um, early to later 1900s, um, but just for, for scale and layout. My artifacts that I recovered, there were 524 of them. So still a good enough amount to understand what had been happening, at least in that portion of the, the property without having an excessive amount to analyze and also to pay for curation then. The dendrochronology for the research, as I said, was actually analyzed by Cornell University. They have a tree ring laboratory that analyzes both European samples and also North American samples. Um, the people are great to work with and you know, were very, very helpful and, and did some excellent research in terms of not only comparing the samples and trying to analyze these home samples to available chronologies, but also using their knowledge in archaeology to, to combine that information. Um, these are some of the data charts that they pulled together. So ideally, when you do dendrochronology, you want to have at least 10 samples per building. And to be honest, that wasn't feasible for my thesis research. You know, I have, you know, X amount of money, even with a grant. Um, and so if more work would happen with dendrochronology on the home, ideally you'd be able to get a few more samples. Um, but with what I submitted, this is the information that could be compared. And it was all pretty, um, pretty much around the same time. You can see that on the left, the samples that were taken from the home and from two other trees in the area were able to be combined into two different chronologies. And then what the analysts at Cornell did was combined an overall Morrow Jones chronology, which is what the what DCNR had been referring to the Carol Cabin as. So the Morrow Jones home with available chronologies. And you can see how they match up both chronologies on the bottom right there and how they do and don't overlap, that gives you kind of a general time of each, of each sample. This chart shows all of the samples that I took that were sent to Cornell. It's important to document where you take them from, um, photograph the locations, and then what Cornell was able to do was look at the, the most exposed, latest tree ring and put it into the chronology and be able to date it. And you can see in the lower right, there's a key different like realistic situations that you'd have to deal with. Is the edge of the timber deteriorated? Um, do you actually have the bark? You know, how confident are you that you have all of the, the tree rings? And one of the issues for hewn logs, of course, is you've already lost external rings and you know it. So being able to take that into account when you make your estimation of when the fell date was. Then the soil sample locations, you can see here's the map. I took seven different samples and I tried to choose different areas around the farm. Like I said, perhaps different fields, looking at if I could get an idea of what was grown there, what might need or extract more nutrients and how that could be shown or reflected in the soil data. I used both XRF that was used for a certain sample, a certain quantity of the samples that I took, and then also one of the basic soil test kits that you can get at Home Depot or Lowe's um, and try to use both of those to compare how good the test was, what information I could get. As you can see, um, the soil test kit you could get at the store didn't, it wasn't able to produce as accurate of data as the XRF could. Um, and for anybody who might not know, XRF is X-ray fluorescence, and it just looks at basically the makeup of the soil. So the results of this research indicated that 
the hand-hewn log homes, the ones that were sampled, probably put the home at fell date of 1775 with additional at least cellar work in 1810. And this comes from two logs in the cellar, like the cellar dates in particular, from both two logs, one with bark and one without bark. I was thinking maybe the one with bark would be significantly newer, but that wasn't correct. So at least as of 2017, um, for the data that I pulled, the home was 205 years old. So this home is over 200 years old that people have been living in it that we know. And the home has been standing for over 240 years, which I think is really cool. Um, and we also know later dates when the repairs were taking place based on um, when the Jones family bought it from the dendrochronology dates um, when the addition was put on. Uh, like I said, 524 artifacts doesn't give you a big picture of the whole property and as a whole, um, but we didn't really find, I didn't really find evidence of children, um, but I could have just been in the, simply the wrong place. And there was some metal detecting that had happened um, for DCNR before I became involved. There was a, a brass ring, it looked like a toy. So that could indicate children. I mean, and we know that children were on the property. And then also subsistence strategies. The farm had a coal seam that was being utilized at least through the Civil War. Um, they had farming, it might not have been animals, but we could see the, the uh, fields in the 1939 aerial. And then also when the Jones family purchased it, Alfred Jones did try his hand at having a Christmas tree farm on the property that didn't really, it wasn't as successful as he had hoped, you know, but it's again, a, a way of linking the, fam, the farm uh, with the broader economy. And Indiana County has a lot of Christmas tree production anyway. So in that area, it kind of does match the, the broader regional economy. So what's happened since then? Um, one of the things is a workshop. And this was created by um, Joe Baker on behalf of DCNR to kind of train graduate and undergraduate students who would be interested in doing survey work and using the necessary survey that needed to take place at the Carroll Cabin for its stabilization as this practice. Um, so a stabilization plan had been produced by a PHMC employee and it was, you know, how do we stabilize the house? What do we do in the short term in order to be able to have this property remain, you know, as best we can until we can create a long-term plan for its preservation. So there was, you know, a, a flyer put out, people um, applied, and we did get, I think, at least at least 12 or 13 students from a couple different universities. Um, and it went really well. We only had six STPs to dig, but as part of the workshop, it wasn't just field work. It was looking at the artifacts you found, washing them, um, analyzing what they were, uh, and then also, as you can see there, field skills. How do you dig an STP? Um, what does a career in CRM look like? So it was a really broad um, way to just introduce a lot of students to archeology span or introduce them to different aspects that they hadn't learned yet. And then as Ira mentioned in the beginning, um, an article that I wrote was accepted for Pennsylvania Heritage for the summer 2020 edition. I was really excited about writing it. Um, one of my mentors, you know, was like, hey, this would be a great article for this. And luckily the editor of the magazine thought so as well. So I would encourage you to read it. It's a very approachable topic. Um, it has a lot of the same information, but a little bit more of the family involvement. And then what does the house look like now? I was actually out there visiting last weekend. So I can tell you with certainty that it is still standing and the stabilization plan has been very successful. Um, this is what the stabilization looked like. Basically where we dug the six STPs is exactly where the pillars went in. And there is a slight lean you may have been able to notice in some of the historic photos that has been there for a while. Uh, I think this is very likely due to the large chimney you can see there in the left photo leaning itself and leaning against the home and pushing it out to the south. So this is a great first step and there's, they're a little hard to see, but there are cables that come from those southern pillars at the top and it doesn't actually cut through the house, but it goes between different parts of the house and the porches and then anchors to a concrete 
uh, based I beam in the northern the northern terminus at, beyond the the addition. So it's really exciting that all of this has helped you know to keep pushing along this project and also that we've gotten even to this stage. Thank you. Okay, well, um, yeah, thank you very much here. Uh, I have at the moment two questions uh, for you. Uh, the first is uh, from Ted Baird and he wants to know what's the length and the width of the cabin footprint? And was there a cellar and uh, you know, talk a little bit about the cellar. So there were, I think it's like 20 feet by maybe 15 feet. I could look at that plan view. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. It wasn't very large, but it was a two story hand hewn cabin, which seems fairly significant um, for as old as it is. There's, there were clapboard siding there was on it, but it's since been torn off. It didn't get refreshed, you know, in the last episode of, of construction and maintenance. Um, there is a cellar under the log, the hand hewn log house portion. And I think it's pretty cool. It looks like the foundation was set from the inside, you know, like um, a hole was dug, the stones were constructed and, and laid in, and they're fairly thick stone walls. And then what's also cool is on the northern side, which would have been, you know, away from that stabilized end that I just showed, um, there's like a half wall. And I wasn't totally sure what the purpose of that was, but I then learned that it's probably to support the chimney um, and to, to create more of a stabilization. And also in that northern stone wall under the, the hand hewn log home, you can see large footstones in different areas, um, one of which is under where the the walkway between the main home and the addition was. So it's it's pretty neat. And there's a lot of different things down there just left over from the last owners. Um, and there were renters in the 70s who were coal miners. Um, but I think the old door, if I remember correctly, that wood panel door that was in the pre-renovation photo, I think it might be downstairs, like in the cellar. But um, those logs too of interest are not hewn. And so I'm not sure, I mean, they're older, but they could have been just to refresh the stabilization of the log home when the Carroll family moved in. Um, or it could have been a log cabin that was on the property or elsewhere, you know, and was reused um, for, for larger floor supports. Okay. Um I had one question and it had to do with the soil sampling. Uh, there are soil, uh, US uh, DA Soil Conservation Service uh, soil maps uh, throughout the state for each county. And I was wondering if you had used soil mapping units to differentiate your samples at all uh, in that. Um, I did look at the soil survey maps. I think most, if not all of the property was Wharton Sandy Loam or Wharton Silt Loam. Um, so I didn't really use that to base my locations off of. Mostly that was purely a product of, you know, uploading a map layer to the Trimble and then putting points within different areas of different fields that I thought maybe would still produce um, different chemical analysis for maybe what was grown there. I was trying to get, get at maybe what was happening on the farm in the 30s, but I wasn't really able to get a lot of that information. There were certain areas where the phosphorus was higher, which often indicates um, you know, more organic activity and potentially more human activity, but that's kind of as far as I was able to get with that. Okay, uh, we have uh, an additional question here. Uh, was there any evidence of a privy? Um, there is a depression near the home. Uh, I'm not sure it could be a privy. I didn't investigate it. Um, pretty much the only excavation that I was doing was in order to answer my overall research questions of building a context. So I didn't really seek that out. It's very possible. I mean, it's a rural, a rural home that's been standing for a long time. There's no doubt that there are at least a couple privies somewhere on the property. Just out of necessity. Yes. Basically. So um, 
And another question is, how did you select the locations for the dendrochronology samples? Um, I knew that I wanted to take a few from the home walls itself, uh, and that was kind of looking for the most intact timbers. And then I also wanted to get a sampling of the logs that were not hewn in the cellar. So I wanted to get, like I said, at least one, but then most of them didn't have bark, like the six or seven logs moving in towards the chimney, but then the two at the end had bark. So I wanted to understand why that was. Um, so I took two from there. And then I also wanted to see if there were nearby trees that might still be in, intact and growing that I could reference, you know, to see if those were local trees that were harvested. Um, so the forester in the one photo helped me get a sample from one of the trees over by that logging road. And then he also knew of a tree that had been cut down due to a PennDOT project and seemed very wide. So he actually cut me a cookie of that tree and then cut like a little pizza slice that I mailed to the Dendro Cornell Tree Ring Lab. Um, and they were using that to also cross state it. So it's kind of just what I could access fairly easily and then what I could afford, how many I could send. Okay, we have a, another question for evidence of a family cemetery nearby. Um, not for this uh, family, not for this property. I do know that there is a local cemetery probably within a few miles of this home that does have, you know, the same time period, similar names that are that are documented in the area, not on the property that I've that I've seen though. Okay, and then we have an, another question here. Uh, you can tell us from a historian because it references a glass tax assessment. So uh, have you looked into the 1798 uh, glass tax assessment list? And I'll let you answer that, but that begs a whole nother question too. So go ahead. I did look through some tax records. I looked for whatever the courthouse had. Um, I wasn't able to find too much, I think for Thomas Ramsey or some of the mid to later inhabitants, um, Virginia was claiming the southwestern portion of Pennsylvania up through like at least maybe the 1800s. I wouldn't quote me on that. There, there's a map though. So I think if I were to do more research, um, looking down in Richmond perhaps would be helpful to maybe find some of the earlier records. Uh, and, and I guess that, that begs the question of, um, I, I guess it's more in a line of speculation here, but um, the legitimacy of the settlement and the placement of the original house. Uh, do you have a feeling that uh, the original inhabitants were here properly, were at, the, at that location properly with land grant or were they perhaps homesteading? So I think there's a very good chance that somebody was living on the property even while Thomas Ramsey had owned the property and he was from England, I think. So there's a very good chance that he might not have known if someone was living there. Um, and if the timbers were at all, if any of them were utilized from a nearby house or a house that had been on there before it was officially settled by whoever owned it, um, you know, I think that's captured in the timbers. A more thorough dendrochronology study of the home might be able to answer some of that. But I, I think it's very possible that someone could have been living on there for a while before any of the, the official owners had moved there. So, I mean, to, to kind of circle around here, uh, the glass tax assessment's only good if you report and people notice. Mm. And there's glass too. Uh, so are there any other questions from the audience here uh, before we wrap up? I'm going to talk a little bit and uh, hopefully there'll be maybe another question or two. Uh, first, I want to thank you on behalf of the Pennsylvania Archaeological Council for providing this presentation.